I'm James Foster, the director of the Institute for International Economic Policy, or IIEP, moderator of today's conversation with Koshik Basu of Cornell University, who will present his newest work in a talk entitled, A Paradox of Morality Using Games to Understand Group Moral Responsibility. Professor Basu needs no introduction, and given his remarkable career in academia, government, and the policy world. Uh, let me just give the basics. Professor Basu is Karl Marx Professor of International Studies and Professor of Economics at Cornell University. He is currently the president of the International Economic Association. It's a testament to Professor Basu's reputation that today's event is being co-sponsored by so many units at GW, including the Department of Philosophy, the Department of Economics and its Microeconomics Workshop, the Elliott School of International Affairs, and its Leadership, Ethics, and Practice, or LEAP, initiative. I've been, I'd like to invite uh, Professor Chris Kojum, who's at Elliott with me, and also directs the LEAP initiative to say a few words. Chris? Uh, yes, uh, James has introduced me and the Leadership, Ethics, and Practice initiative. We are delighted to co-host today's event. It is a key part of our mission to bring in distinguished uh, scholars and practitioners to talk about leadership and ethics issues relating to uh, public policy problems. Uh, and today's topic on uh, morality and uh, group choices is uh, very much in the wheelhouse of what we seek to impart to our students. So uh, thank you for the opportunity to co-sponsor and welcome to uh, Professor Basu. Thank you so much, Chris. And also thanks to economists, Brian Stewart and Stephen Smith, philosophers, Ted Zawitsky and Laura Papish, and the Elliott School's own Ellen Garvey and Joe Strodel and my team at IIEP for their roles in making today's events possible. Now, for those of you who've attended a previous IIEP event, either in the Elliott School or online, you know you can expect a lively, an informative conversation on such topics as US-China economic relations, urbanization and poverty, global economic governance, climate change, green finance, or digital trade. Our webinar series, Facing Inequality, is a multidisciplinary conversation on this most important of social and economic challenges. Our last episode brought Georgetown political scientist Nita Rudra across town to tell us how informal workers in South Asia view international trade. Two weeks from now on September 9th, we begin our new series, Envisioning India, with a presentation by former Deputy Governor of the Reserve Bank of India, Peter Alacharya, on his new book, The Quest for Financial Stability in India, with two discussants renowned in their own right, Pulitzer Prize winning author of The Lords of Finance, Leerquat Ahmad, who like today's speaker was also an official with the World Bank, and former Deputy Governor and IMF Executive Director Rakesh Mohan, who, like today's speaker, was Chief Economic Advisor to the Government of India. If you can't make it to one of our events, please tune in later on our YouTube channel, IIEP GW. Now for today's event. It gives me great pleasure to welcome Professor Koshik Basu back home to Washington and the Elliott School where for four years, as Chief Economist of the World Bank, he co-taught a course with me in the Harry Harding Auditorium called Introduction to Game Theory and Strategic Thinking. We had 160 students per class and many visitors from the bank and the fund and other uh, institutions in the neighborhood. He accepted no pay for his services, which seems odd for an economist, but I can explain. In fact, I'll let his advisor, and Nobel Prize winner Amartya Sen explained, which he did in an email to me. He said, and I quote, he is absolutely delighted that he can combine, thanks to your help, his desire to accept Jim Kim's offer and yet continue to teach. And the actual experience has been wonderful for him. I have not seen him so happy for a long time. So, Kaushik, before you begin your talk, here's your chance to reminisce. Was it really that much fun teaching GW students? 
James, um, Chris and James, uh, thank you very much. It was a sheer delight, I have to say. And as you're speaking, um, I get a nostalgic feeling of those days. For me, it was also such a hectic time at the World Bank that the little bit of escape to academe, which is where I spent all my life, was so very welcome. And Harry Harding Auditorium, as you uttered those words, I have not used those words since leaving the bank, but they come back rushing back to me. Just wonderful, really. With the students and the informal conversation outside the classroom as well, it was spectacular, my four years and five days of escape each year um, when I did this. But, but wait a minute, you were chief economist of the World Bank. That's a full-time job. I bet your colleagues at the World Bank thought you were nuts. How did you do it? Yeah, they thought I was nuts, but some of them came to the lecture. Some directors from different countries. I remember the director from Russia was there once because we were talking of the Cuban Missile Crisis, so, which meant that actually they got seriously interested in the material. So the initial worry that the chief economist of the World Bank is escaping, I think they felt comforted that that was not the case. It was a useful engagement. Thank you. I just not didn't mute. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, I'll come back now. Each term, we brought 160 GW students to the World Bank's Preston Auditorium for a single class during that term. Do you remember how that tradition began? Uh, I remember. I remember you. You're asking. In, in the Elliott School, there was a problem with the steam, and we had to shut down on the second day of class one time. And so I called the World Bank, I called your assistant, and we worked it out so that the Preston Auditorium was available that evening within two hours. Right. All the students were given notices and they walked across, went through the, the scanning machine and had class. And from that point on, let's say, we said, let's do that on purpose. Yeah, yeah. And it was a very heavy security place because there were lots of meetings that usually took place in Preston. So it was very unusual setting with lots of students collecting in Preston Auditorium. Indeed. And then one final question. You lived, was it on the 24th Street when you were here? Uh, on 24th Street. 24th, uh, yeah. On the edge of the GW campus. And you used to walk to and from work each day right across campus. What was that like? How did actually, you know, I, James, how did very like GW campus vibe? Uh, James, actually, good you ask. It was for me just such a breath of fresh air walking through a university campus. There was the Starbucks over there where I would occasionally pause. So it was lovely from home to office. 10, 15 minute walk, no more. But being able to walk through a university where I've spent all my life was for me like taking in oxygen and then going into the World Bank full time, 12 hours of just chock-a-block work. Indeed. Well, thank you for your thoughts on your time here at GW. Now, enough of the past. Tell us about your newest work on morality and game theory. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Koshik Basu. Thank you very much. James and Chris, uh, thank you very much for the invitation. And I wish it would not just be a virtual experience of GWU, but we have no choice in that. Uh, I'm, I must also thank Katya and Kyle. I, I needed uh, the little bit of a, a primer that we've got, and you'll check out how we do after that. Um, I uh, am presenting a somewhat unusual paper. Um, it's a paper I like a lot. Paper is the wrong word because it's a bit of a cluster of work I'm doing. I've shared one piece with you all, but I'm hoping I will do a couple. Let me tell you why I'm enjoying this work, and I think it's quite important. Occasionally in life, you do research as an academic, a research which springs not from reading other people's papers, but when you're thinking about reality and the world around. Actually, if I may put in a footnote, my work with James on uh, literacy, in the end, it became axioms and theorems. But we had begun with an observation about India's distribution of literacy, which intrigued us, and we chatted about that, and that grew into an academic paper. What I'm presenting today is something very similar. One particular use of moral, the uh, moral responsibility in public discourse was troubling me a lot. We hold groups morally responsible. You'll see all the time that happening. We talk of uh, the 
Democratic Party, the Republicans, the opposition should do this, all groups, and we morally castigate them. I mean, the one which we all of us do with great ease is North Korean leaders are dreadful. The collectivity of that, not for a moment pausing to think that it's a collection, and you don't quite know when a collection behaves in a particular way, what do the components of the collection want? And that, I think, is not doing that adequately has led to poor quality thinking, often collective blame out of which you can do nothing. You have to learn to apportion that. This was troubling me. Then um, more than a year ago now, had a I was chatting with one of my colleagues, philosophy colleague, colleagues at Cornell, who said, why don't you come and give a completely informal talk? I said, if it's really completely informal, I'll be happy to do, uh, because I, I don't know the literature. I don't even know if there's a literature. And I gave a talk a little more than a year ago, actually about a year and a half ago, to Cornell's philosophy department, to one of those uh, brown bag lunches. And that's when it began to grow. I got references. I soon realized that, of course, people have grappled with it. Important papers are there. But I had come in from a slightly different angle already. And thank goodness I had got into the field before beginning to read the literature, because I was using elements of game theory to sort of formulate the problem that was troubling me. And that's how the paper has, the central paper has emerged. I've got another couple of papers and what I'm going to present to you today is a blend of these two things. In the middle of that, the core of this today will be what I have called a paradox of morality. So it's a game which is a bit of a paradoxical game. I use the term paradox uh, somewhat um, hesitantly, because this is not a deep logical paradox. There are those, I, I love paradoxes, so I have to be careful about the term paradox. It's not that two different ways of thinking, hard logical reasoning lead you to conflicting conclusions. That's a hard paradox. Two different ways of reasoning and you've reached a different destination and you feel troubled. This is not quite that. This is a paradox in the sense that I'm going to illustrate uh, through a game something that conflicts with our intuition about morality and moral behavior. So it's not really a deep logical paradox, but like the prisoner's dilemma. When you first see it, you get a bit of a jolt that I thought the invisible hand of selfishness works. It does not work. It's that sense I'm using the term paradox. So I will first, this is the way I want to begin. I'm going to first give you a couple of uh, real world, very brief illustrations of how we use group moral attribution, very slack, very easy. But the reason for that, and let me give you the preamble, is all human beings feel very uncomfortable if you see a collective behave badly, do uh, get into a dreadful outcome, not to be able to attribute moral responsibility leaves us very uncomfortable. So we would not think twice, we would very quickly blame a group or individuals without really dissecting because we feel uncomfortable seeing this dreadful moral act and not being able to attribute it. Philosophers have come in and there's been a lot of powerful writing. Joel Feinberg in 1968. I got into this game theory also people have written, Matthew Braham and Van Hess, Philip Petit, using little blends of game theory with this they've done. And for them also this question begins to come up that these attributions that we do, but in most philosophers, there is a proclivity to somehow bend the story to be able to attribute moral responsibility. They do it intelligently, not like the lay person uh, by, by just the waving of hands giving responsibility, but developing rules. And I will argue, and you will soon discover that my own proclivity is not to do that, that there will be situations where a dreadful thing has happened, but we cannot give moral responsibility to individuals. There are still things to be done without giving moral responsibility. You don't want that to be repeated, but moral responsibility to me is harder and the paradoxical game illustrates that. But before that, a couple of just everyday conversational examples and let me try to do a share at this point. Okay. So you don't want to stare at the title page for I'm going to give you examples from everyday speech. 
where we do group moral attribution in a glib fashion. So here is Nancy Altman and Linda Benesh uh, in the Huffington Post, I'm quoting them. The Republican elites immorality goes well beyond Donald Trump. The immorality and disdain of today's Republican elites shines through in the policies that they embrace. So Republican elites is a collectivity and the moral, the moral term is being attributed to the whole group. But to be now, it's politically divisive times. I've given an example on criticism of the Republicans. So I have to give you another one, which goes the other way. So here it is. And we've got Dave King in the conservative daily news. And all you have to see is just a short quote. Again, a collective responsibility. Here is a short list of the damage being done to our country, United States, by the immoral Democrat party, immoral party. I don't want to elaborate. The only thing I'll tell you is his list was actually not very short. If you read the list, he gives lots of reasons for that. Then, in a similar vein, we will hear people talking about the Tutsis. You will talk here about the North Korean state. And here is a quotation from the Telegraph. The reclusive North Korea is one of the last Stalinist regimes and is ideologically committed to cutting itself off from the international community in pursuit of its doctrine of national self-reliance. Now, here's what I want to warn you. These, these are fine, fair enough to say that, but very often, if we don't dissect the strategic interior of these groups, you miss out on important points. The thing that has often struck me about North Korea, North Korea in a bizarre way fascinates me is in this collectivity of the North Korean leadership, there may well be individuals who are aspiring to do something very different from what the group is doing. But there is no way they can break out. They are in a game with other leaders and they are trapped. Once we pay attention to this, we will devise other strategies of taking on a group that is behaving badly. Once you realize that every element of the group need not be behaving the way you think the group is behaving. Let me give you one more example, a politically very touchy example, and then I want to move into a little bit of formalism. You know, on um, 14th of February last year, 2019, there was a terrorist attack in India on the Jammu Kashmir highway. Uh, there was an Indian petrol police, uh, Central Reserve police were moving complete peacetime moving, normal move, movement, when there was a terrorist attack, 46 of them were killed. And the responsibility was taken by a group in Pakistan, jaish e Muhammad took the responsibility. So it was clear that that group had committed, the, uh, done the attack. This became, of course, a huge story around the world and in India. And I happened to be in India at actually um, uh, visiting IIT, uh, IIT Delhi at that time, this had happened, people were very upset. There was a television discussion going on, on the terrorist attack. And Navjot Singh Sidhu, uh, if there are Indians in the audience, they will recognize the name, who's a television commentator and a very prominent cricket player. So on retiring from cricket, he's got into policy and policy discussions, he appears. Navjot Singh Sidhu came on television and said, uh, uh, while this discussion was going on, he said that, look, this is a dastardly terrorist attack. Just we have to do everything to stop similar things. He was very upset. But, he, but then he went on to add, but we must not hold all Pakistanis, entire Pakistan, responsible for this act. And this in turn caused a furor that how can you exempt anyone in Pakistan from this dreadful attack that had taken place. The furor became so huge that Sony television had to take Navjot Singh Sidhu off. I mean, he, he could not appear on their programs anymore because people felt that all Pakistanis have to be blamed for this act. And that opens up a question. When there is a dreadful moral act, and you know the people who committed it, they belong to a larger group, do you have to hold the entire larger group responsible? I don't think so. 
And I'll give you an example why not is, I'll take this particular example, the attack that took place from a group in Pakistan. Instead of Pakistan as a group, out of which this small set of people who did the attack, and there may have been many more people who are planning, they are all responsible, that subgroup. But we, if we hold all Pakistanis responsible, the entire country, then by that logic, that anyone from your group commits a crime and the whole group is held responsible, I'll create another group. Let me create a group called Brakistan, B-R-A, Brakistan. Brakistan is an even larger group, which is a group which con contains, let us say, all the Brahmins of India and Pakistan, and you call that larger group Brakistan. The group that committed the attack, jaish e mohammed is a part of Brakistan. But will you hold Brakistan responsible for this? The answer is certainly not. The Brahmins of India had nothing to do with it. You, and there's no reason to hold them responsible. You can blame them for other things, but not for this. But as soon as you recognize this, you have to recognize that even within Pakistan, there are people who don't even know they are Pakistanis. There are tribals who have been born there, whose ancestors were born there, who don't know they are Pakistanis. Do you want to hold them responsible? Answer is no. You have to cut and splice and get to the core and hold individuals responsible. You have to be able to attribute. These are just examples. But what I want to do now is what got me excited in this problem as an academic venture, because I constructed a game where I was not quite directly engaging with the philosophers. The philo philosophical literature, and I will implicitly, I'm touching on that, were concerned about if people, instead of undertaking action X, undertook action Y, would that change the outcome? If so, then if a bad outcome had occurred and by taking action Y, you could change the outcome, you are responsible. And I agree, all the people who by their own action could have changed something, they are responsible. But beyond that, you have a problem. And this, I'm going to use a somewhat unusual uh, method. I'm going to convert people from ordinary self-interested individuals, the kind that we analyze in economics, to moral characters. So they become moral. And I've got two games, um, uh, which depending on time, I'll present both or one. One game is called After the Seminary. One of the selfish players goes to a seminary and comes back, converted into a morally good creature, the kind of creature that I would consider morally good is what I'm modeling. And the other one is where all the players are taught by a good Samaritan and they become good Samaritans. And I will show you that actually the moral outcome can become worse when individuals become moral. That is my story. Don't spend time reading this. Let me explain this. And then I'm going to come in. Um, uh, then, um, uh, because I want to do it in a very basic way so that people who don't have any game theory background will follow. I have one piece of advice to you. Since I'll go back and forth with, between two or three pages, you may want to have a pen and paper with you just to write down the first concentrate on the left-hand matrix, which is called the payoff matrix. What I'm describing to you is a game where I'm going to convert an individual into a moral individual later and see what that does to the outcome. The game is as follows. It's a world in which, it's a society, I call it a society in which there are two players and the players and what they do are shown in the payoff matrix on the left and what they get. Are you seeing my cursor, James, or anyone else? Just or Katya or Kyle, just tell me. That's great. Okay, good. So there's one player who chooses between the two rows, has to choose between A and B, and another player who has to choose between columns A and B. After they have made the choice, depending on what choice they've made, the payoffs that they get are shown in these boxes. So if they both choose A, player one who's chosen this A gets $100, and player two who's chosen this A gets $101. Let's 
Likewise, and let me take one more. If player one chooses A, player two chooses B, both of them get $100 each. This is the game that they are playing. Start by looking at just this. They are like, in a game theory we do, they are selfish individuals. They want to maximize their own dollar payoffs. If they are playing this game, it's not quite maximizing your dollar payoff in a non-strategic environment. Here, you have to be careful about what the other person does. What will be the outcome? The outcome, in this case, I will argue that I'm going to use the notion of Nash equilibrium and argue that that's the perfectly reasonable equilibrium notion. So you, even if you didn't know of Nash, in this particular game and in the games that I will discuss today, you will zero in on Nash. A Nash equilibrium is an outcome where once you've got into that, no player has any interest in moving out unilaterally. So let's check. If I'm taking a little bit of time, the people who are trained game theorists will get a bit bored, but then I want to move quickly and I want everyone to follow. If both of them choose A, player one is getting $100, player two is getting $101. Is this an equilibrium? The answer is no, because player one will switch from this A to B, from A to B, and then the outcome will switch from this box to this box, and player one would pick up $101 instead of $100. So AA is not Nash because one of them will deviate from here and they will go there. Is BA Nash? Player one choosing B, player two choosing A. Is this an equilibrium? Nash or even intuitively, is this an equilibrium? The answer is no, because if player two switches to B, the outcome will switch from here to here and player two, instead of getting 100, will get 101. This is not an equilibrium. This is not an equilibrium. Is this an equilibrium? Answer is no, because both players will want to move unilaterally. They will do better if they do. So none of these three is an equilibrium. The only equilibrium is BB. If you have only one Nash equilibrium, and that's a strict equilibrium, that is perfectly reasonable that that's going to be the outcome. So the outcome in this game is going to be BB. That's it. This is the standard use of game theory. Now, in this society, there was a third person, a bystander. But these two individuals being completely selfish individuals, like in standard game theory, they couldn't care less what was happening to the bystander. The bystander is an individual who is very poor and who, whose payoff depends entirely on what the two players do. The bystander does nothing, sits on the roadside and gets the fallout of the action of the two players. In some sense, for the game theorists, you could actually think of this as a three-player game where player um, one chooses between A and B, player two chooses between A and B, and player three makes no choice, just gets a payoff. The payoff that player three gets, that's in the bystander's earning box that you have over here. Those are the payoffs. And those are the payoffs in terms of the actions taken by players one and two, and the payoff earned by the bystander. So when players one and two choose both choose A, the bystander gets $2. When they choose, player one chooses B, two chooses A, the bystander gets zero. If they both choose B, the bystander gets uh, four. If player one chooses A and two chooses B, the bystander gets $8. So when these two players play the game, uh, players one and two, the bystander ends up in equilibrium getting $4. So that is the outcome of this game. The two players are getting $101 each, and this player is getting, the bystander is getting $4. An outsider, you, me, anyone walking past here, will look at this outcome and say, isn't it dreadful that these people have hundreds, they are so well off. If they moved from BB to AB, a different outcome, the group, the bystander who's miserably poor at four, would move to eight, still very poor, but a bit better off. Ordinary human empathy, kindness should prompt the group, in this case players one and two, to a different 
behavior which will make the bystander get a better fallout. We would, most of us would argue like this and let us say that player one here goes to the seminary. Goes to the seminary, is given a lecture exactly of the, I'm the a person teaching in the seminary and I give exactly this lecture to that player. Say that, look, don't worry about the other rich people, but the poor people who are getting a fallout of your action, have some kindness for them. Minimally, this is what you should do, I tell this person. You look at your own payoff, that's, we are human, we will look at our own income, but treat the very poor person's income, one dollar of that person's income, like one dollar of your income. So anyone who's below ten dollars of income, that person's one dollar, treat it like your one dollar. Which means, when this person returns from the seminary, the game is different because player one is now adding up, looking at, in looking at the outcome AA, player one feels, well, in that case, I'm getting a joy of $102. Do you follow this? Because the player one now is adding up the bystander's payoff. So the payoff here is 102 and 101 to player two. If the outcome was AB, player one would get a joy, as if joy, of 108. The eight from the bystander is added by player one to player one's payoff. And player two would still get 100. So this 100 would become 102, this 100 becomes 108, this 101 becomes 105, this 101 remains 101 because it's zero gets added to it. So after player one returns from the seminary, player two is the same, the game changes to after the seminary game. This is the game. Same story as before, but player one is now giving a one dollar of the poor person bystander is the same as one dollar to me, has become a moral creature. What happens to the outcome? Let's take a look. In this new game, and this you should be able to see now, there is only one equilibrium, only one outcome for the pair, this pair, AA where they are getting 102 and 101, no one can do better by unilaterally deviating. If player one deviates, player one will do worse, 102 to 101. If player two deviates, player two will do worse, so neither will deviate. What about the outcome AB, which is where we wanted them to go, where the bystander would be better off? Well, if they were here, then player two would change from B to A, and the payoff would go from 100 to 101 for player two. So this one would not stabilize. This two player game would not be here. There is no other equilibrium. The only equilibrium is AA, which means, I'm just going back for a moment, the bystander who was getting $4 after player one becomes moral and comes back, the bystander is going to get $2. The bystander is worse off. If you look at the outcome of this game, outsiders, we will say, look, what dastardly behavior by these two individuals, the two players, that immoral behavior, that just because they want 100 and 101, a difference of $1, they are penalizing this poor bystander who's getting two. What escapes us is in this group that is behaving miserably, the group of player one and player two, there's one player who's actually a very moral player, player one. And in fact, the group's behavior is morally worse by virtue of this player being a moral player. The conversion of an individual from selfish to moral makes the group outcome go worse. That is the crux of the dilemma, the paradox that I wanted to pose. One person becoming more moral makes the group's behavior go more immoral, which means that when we look at a full group's behavior and do very quick attribution about immorality on the part of all the individuals in the group, we may be utterly wrong. There may be individuals in the group by virtue of whose morality the group is behaving even 
more immorally. The paradox is very similar to the prisoner's dilemma or a game that I have been very involved in and I wrote it up once years ago, the traveler's dilemma. There are actually similar games in philosophy also. I'm trying to uh, recall there was something in analysis, which is a very similar uh, kind of a uh, game. All those games like the prisoner's dilemma and these games show that each individual being rational does not mean that the group will do well for itself. Our being able to understand this, dissecting <coughs> the prisoner's dilemma has been extremely useful because we are able to address the commons problem. The globe, world's environment is still a disaster, but nevertheless, we do understand a little bit better what's happening. We realize that when individuals behave collectively badly, destroying the environment, the lesson is not to say that, look, you're hurting yourself, so be even more selfish. We realize that being self-interested is not working in their self-interest. That's what the prisoner's dilemma tells you. Working in your self-interest is not serving your self-interest. So you need collective agreements and things like that. And today, a whole lot of the global effort about climate change, about our holding back, is from the recognition that individuals aspiring for their own good need not result in the good for the individual. And what I'm urging people to do is to use games like this to pose the same question about morality, that individuals being moral is very often not good enough to achieve morality. In fact, individuals going moral can make the outcome even worse. The next game, for reasons of time, I was, um, uh, uh, James, tell me, I'm going to give myself another sort of 10 minutes is that sounding right? Exactly. OK. In which case, I will not present the next game to you, because after that, there are some open-ended questions which I want to give you a flavor of. That I'll tell you what the next game is about. And that is something I've written up. And I'll be I, James may have shared it with some people. And I'll be happy to share it later with you all. In this game, what I did was one player becomes moral and the that person's morality causes a problem and really I, I the reason i'm stressing this repeatedly is also things like um group responsibility often leads to not quite racism but very similar things i mean a dreadful uh, act takes place from a country from a collectivity people who are notionally a part of that collection we can't hold each one of them as morally guilty in fact some of them may be opposite, they may be extremely moral, utterly in disagreement with what is being done by the group, but they are caught there. This is strategically important because looking at North Korea, we may be able to dissect and say there's one person sitting in there behaving very badly, but who's a moral creature in total uh, disapproval of what North Korea is doing, but that person is in a trap. Then you think of a policy, how you can give that person a leeway to come out of it because that person is caught in a trap, so these are the kinds of thinking. One more thing I wanted to ask myself is if instead of one person becoming moral, if all the players became moral, could you have a reversal of a moral, the moral outcome becoming more immoral? The answer is exactly yes. You can construct another example. It will need three strategies. At least I could not get anything with two strategies. Three strategies, two players behaving atrociously with a bystander getting the impact of their behavior. Both of them become moral creatures and moral in the way, in, as I did in this game, they value their own welfare. They don't look at other rich people. They look at the, all the poor people, the bystanders. They value their own dollar and the bystanders dollar in exactly the same way. Both of them come back moral creatures and the outcome becomes an utterly immoral outcome as a consequence of their morality. Morality in a strategic environment, like in a game, and games are a part of life, can deliver immoral group behavior. And to be able to dissect is to be able to help these people to say that, look, as a game theorist, as a moral philosopher, I want to urge you that this is how you handle. I'm not going to take you through the next game. Uh, um, this is the game, which I'll make happily make it available to you. Uh, I don't know. Okay, let me actually add. I, yeah, I don't want this picture to be distracting. So don't think about it. I will come to this picture 
after some time, but this is a picture hopefully I will get to a bit later. Let me tell you now, uh, assume that the second example is presented, even everyone becoming immoral results in immorality. What do you do about this? Now, when you say that you don't hold people morally responsible easily, arbitrarily, it does not mean you don't do anything. There are things to be done, and that is what I want to pay attention to. I have um, been talking in terms of, uh, uh, in the paper, in one of the papers, about uh, the concept of conferred morality. Uh, this actually, I, I got stumbled onto this topic from one of my colleagues, uh, philosophy uh, co colleagues at Cornell. Uh, I got this idea, and then I've been developing it in this context. There are situations in life where you can't hold individuals morally responsible. Like in my, uh, the example that I gave uh, just now after the seminary game, I will not say that the moral creature is uh, immoral because you're lead, creating this dreadful outcome. No, but nevertheless, you can think in terms of creating incentives or writing up rules of behavior where the rules confer a morality. I'll try to explain this with an example. Suppose in a village, in a little village, there are two ponds. And current, currently, 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 dispose their garbage into both ponds. And let's say that any garbage disposed in a pond makes the fish vanish from that pond. So any garbage in a pond makes the fish vanish. Currently, half the villagers throw uh, their uh, garbage in pond A and half the villagers throw their garbage in pond B. There's no fish in the village. Now, uh, and all of them are unhappy by this. They want fish. Now say a new law is propounded, that it is wrong to throw garbage in pond B. By incidentally, I'm putting in a bit of a rule just to make it, uh, this a tight example that garbage has to be thrown in some pond. There is no other way of disposing of garbage. You have to throw it into a pond. Now, you make a law saying that no one should can throw garbage in pond A. You can only throw your garbage in pond B. Let us say that the law is enforced. People start throwing garbage in pond B. Fish begins to flourish in pond A. Throwing garbage in pond a will soon appear an immoral thing to do. It's a deontological ethic. It's no longer consequentialism. In fact, my, one of the things takeaways from my example also is in life, there has to be scope for deontological ethics and deontological ethics, where the deontological ethic is derived from a collective consequentialist objective, target. You've got a collective consequentialist target from that, you construct a deontological ethic. I instinctively am a believer in consequentialism and only reluctantly given to deontological ethics. But the more I've played around with these examples, the more convinced I've become that in life, you do need deontological ethics. Certain things you do because it is right in itself. And look at the pond example. Initially, it's just a law. Don't throw garbage in pond B. Soon it will acquire a moral status. Anyone who throws garbage in pond B will consider committing an immoral act. I've got a slightly more elaborate example of this in my um, uh, paper, um, uh, the one paper that I, I'm in a um, position to share, and you'll, you'll get to see that. So my thought from this is very often you will not be able to attribute morality to individuals. Nevertheless, you can do intelligent conferring of morality uh, by constructing laws, pretending that as though it's a, law, um, it's a moral statement you're making. Once the law begins to be followed, a deontological ethic will begin to appear in society. You should wear a mask, and that's your moral requirement. And once that becomes a moral requirement, even in situations where actually it makes no consequentialist difference, it becomes an ethic to put on the mask. So that's a deontological ethic, and it emerges from propounding a law or at least making a public statement by a leader saying these are the things you ought to do. After some time, that ethic becomes a part of human morality 
So the way to confront these problems of collective bad behavior, yes, in many situations, you will be able to apportion responsibility on individuals. I, I don't want to take away from that. And in one of the two papers, I'm actually playing around with two papers, in one of those papers, and these philosophers have done a lot, and especially uh, Braham and Van Hess, they've done it, dissecting different kinds of individual moral responsibility. But over and above that, you will hit paradoxes of the kind that I've constructed, where you will not be able to heap a moral responsibility, but you can nevertheless construct a law which after some time will nurture a deontological ethic. Two other points I want to make. So let me make one point which I'll make very briefly and put it aside, and then another one which involves this graph and I, this picture, and then I'll stop. Um, easy but philosophically important point at one level illustrating a mistake that game theorists make but a mistake which is an inevitable mistake you can't avoid that mistake and in fact as i remember my prof one of my professors very well known economist now who used to be a mathematician at lse ken binmore in class one point once pointing out saying that the foundations of mathematics are riddled with paradoxes Nevertheless, mathematics is a useful subject, a very, very useful subject. I think similarly about game theory. The foundations of game theory are riddled with paradoxes. That does not mean game theory is useless or unimportant. It's still very useful, but there are paradoxes to be solved to make it even better. One of them is the following. When you describe a game, like I've done after the seminary, two players, one bystander, we usually think of this as the game of life. The game of life is a term due to, I think Ken Binmore was the first person who did it. Ken certainly has written a lot about that. The game of life is all there is to life. You've described the full society with all the options open. So when in that society, those three individuals, the two players and the bystander and what they can do is all there is to the world. There's nothing else. Think of that as the game of life. What do we economists do? We describe a game of life, people playing, this is the outcome, and then we say that, look, this is a dreadful outcome. We have to do something else. This is what we should do. Who is talking? As soon as you have people talking about how we should change the game, change the incentives, you are recognizing that that is not really the game of life. There are other people outside sitting who can change what the players can do, who can coax the players to behave differently. So beginning with the game of life and saying this is all there is to it and this is what will happen, and then to discuss how to bring in new punishments, new rules to change the outcome shows that what you began with as the game of life was not really the game of life. There were other creatures outside that game, namely you and others, who can sit and begin to devise new rules and change behavior. The game of life is always problematic. For the cleanness, closeness of the analysis, we close it and say, this is a game of life, analyze the outcome. But as soon as we begin to say, then say that now we should bring in some new ethics, train people to behave differently. We are recognizing that there was more to the game than, than, than we had started out with. I don't know how to solve this problem. I sort of speculate in one or two paragraphs. I've done it in several places. This troubles me. I don't have the power to take this problem on. But I think it is a bit like in set theory, where in the olden days, you would start out by saying, consider the universal set, set of everything. As Bertrand Russell realized that that, Russell did not realize what was causing a paradox in the beginning. Russell bumped into a paradox. And then it became clear that the implicit use of that assumption, that there is something called the set of everything is the cause of the Russell paradox. So how do set theorists work? They start by saying, consider this to be the universal set. You define a universal set, the way game theorists define the game of life, fully aware that there are things outside that, but we will not tread outside this for now. That's the way we manage. But every time you confront a moral problem like this, you are also confronting the paradox that the game of life in the end is not the game of life. There is more beyond it. I don't know how to solve it, but I think this is something that we need to confront. 
James, I'm going over a little bit. Should I take another five minutes or I could stop? Uh, 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 it's a very attractive picture. I know I've got in front of you all, but that this will take me another five minutes. Why don't we stop you and get the main point across? The main point across? And, uh, yeah. People yeah. asking people questions. Asking questions. Fun, we'll I, come I'm fun, happy we'll to stop because what I was about to open up would actually to do justice to this would take another 10, 15 minutes. So it's better not to do. And I will share my paper with you all. So let me stop. Right. So thank you for thank you for with uh, plenty of great ideas, a really interesting, insightful presentation, absolutely clear as usual. Um, I'm gonna take a crack at a brief summary and then pose a few questions. Those of you who are out there, please start formulating questions yourselves and add them to the Q&A function in WebEx. Right, so this paper imagines a world where becoming moral means altering one's preferences from self-regarding to other-regarding, right? To altruistic or empathetic. It assumes players will continue the, to play the game strategically according to their new altruistic preferences. The key examples focus on the space in between two extreme cases. First, where people are entirely self-interested or individualistic, self-regarding. Second, where everyone is entirely altruistic with respect to everyone else or the collective outcome. And that's an extreme outcome that really you didn't focus on, but it is the extreme outcome where we all figure out what's best for everyone to do and we actually wind up doing it, even game theoretically, for obvious reasons, everyone shares the same payoffs. The focus in this paper and in the presentation was on the intermediate cases where some people are altruistic and their altruism is limited to certain other people. It provides particularly salient examples in which greater altruism winds up hurting the intended target of the altruism when all is said and done, or in game theoretic terms, in equilibrium. In other words, the road from individual outcome due to self-interested players to the collective outcome due to fully altruistic people who feel each other's pains and pleasures can have unexpected dips and valleys. This is the paradox. Technically, it resembles other examples of non-monotonicities in economics by say Peyton Young in the context of cooperative games or in measurement, subgroup consistency or inconsistency. I reiterate that this is a local paradox while moving from extreme case one to extreme case two is extreme is certainly better moving part of the way in the context of strategic behavior need not be. The rest of Koshik's arguments then grope for practical solutions to the paradox. Maybe implementing a law constraining behavior would itself become a norm that supports the collective outcome. He calls this conferring morality. This might even help in cases where agents are too small to individual, individually impact outcomes such as the tragedy of the commons, or perhaps in cases of too many equilibria. That's what he would have been talking about there when absolute coordination failure is a central feature, right? Laws or other institutions can help signal focal points where the collective outcome is almost completely reached with a little penalty to get there. A fun paper to read with plenty of ideas. Now, some quick comments and questions. First, how good or moral is the collective outcome really? The poorest person is still earning little and the rich are earning a lot. Through altruism, the poor gets an extra crumb. Why not simply allow transfers from rich to poor, which I presume would lead to equal outcome in an altruistic world in a model with concave utility, instead of the fake equality via empathy. Oh, I feel your pain, thank you very much. But yet you still have little. Second, I think morality is not changing preferences, it is acting. The Samaritan in the Bible story is not, was not a good neighbor because he felt the other's pain. The two dudes that passed by before went that far, but rather because he acted on behalf of the other, rendering timely aid and paying for his recovery. That's what is taught in seminary. This brings us to the central point you talked upon 
just a little in the paper in the presentation, the creation really of new strategies. This is what great leaders do. But game changers are hard to predict. Strategy creation is one of the key problems with game theory as a predictive and theoretical subject. But it's how games are won in practice. Conferring morality via laws clearly can help. Driving rules on the left side or the right side of the road have great benefits, we all know that, but the approach has a dark side too. Using laws or norms to create moral legitimacy begs the question of power and can lead to the normalization of really bad behaviors. For example, men and boys should eat first, and women and girls should eat if there's food left afterwards. Self-imposed adaptive behavior is clearly not your intention, but could be the result. And ultimately, all the discussion in the first section is turned on its head if we discover that the other person actually wasn't poor, but is a trust baby with tons of outs outside income. What happens then and how would you interpret it? Finally, on a technical note, on the game you didn't go into with the three players, what if not two, but only one person in your example becomes altruistic? What happens then? I'll give you a hint. Chaos. There's no pure strategy equilibrium. Thank you very much. I look forward to your responses. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, James. Thank you very much. Actually, just uh, wonderful. Uh, I, I wish I could, uh, in case there's something written up, I'd love to get it. But I've actually been jotting down as you we were speaking. Let me take uh, just a couple of uh, points that you are uh, um, uh, bringing in over here. I actually want to, again, stress, this is such a, where I think we are on the same uh, page completely. This is such a risky topic because by not apportioning blame, you don't even want people to sit in their comfort zone and continue the same way. Adaptive behavior, the last point that you were making, people behave atrociously very often. We just continue the way it is. Uh, we eat, the men will eat the food first, the women will get what is left after that. You are taking no decision on that. You may not even have scope for that. But if collectively there is a great game changer brought in, and the game changer changes the game and changes our awareness. We can begin to change. Uh, my conferred morality is a bit like that, saying that the fact that I can't, oh, from this outcome, point fingers and say, you are the person to blame, does not mean you do nothing. You then go into the domain of conferred deontological ethic and use that to change a behavior. And after some time, when the behavior actually changes, that becomes a moral thing. We do object to people's certain kinds of behavior. So there we are on the same. Let me try to pick up one or two areas. One more thing which where I agree, and then one where I probably have a disagreement with you, but it is also quick. I may be getting that wrong. One agreement is, I, I actually picked up one term as you were speaking, and I think that's the way we should focus. The role of the game changer. I feel actually it's such an exciting thought that we do game theory analysis. We never analyze the role of the game changer. But that actually is meta game theory, where you've written the game, and then you're trying to model that, well, there can be some role of being a game changer, someone who's not just choosing strategies within the game, but someone who's trying to change the game that people are playing. And that, I think, intertwines with the question of um, uh, the game of life and the paradox of the game of life is that we model players. We don't even allow anyone to think beyond that and think in terms of changing the game itself. There should be some way of modeling that, and that will actually, I think, have a lot of interface with real life problems. So it's a lovely term, and I, I will try to actually use it in this context. One place where I may have uh, uh, had a, a disagreement, when you're saying that this is a, a local problem and not a, um, um, if everyone, uh, uh, I have to just construct some more games, which I can't do it so quickly to check this out. But in a particular game, I think I will be able to construct where if one person goes moral, the outcome is bad. And when both go moral, the outcome is even worse. Then it's a monotonically bad journey all the way. My hunch is that's possible. 
Don't know. I, 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 uh, you, you may be right, but I need much more time to think than uh, staring into a screen and doing that. One thing that you uh, did not mention, or which was sort of there a bit uh, between the lines, is you're right that what I've described is other regarding behavior that I'm concerned about myself, but about others, but only of one kind. And this I've had from referees of the journal uh, uh, saying that I, I should address this, is that the other regarding behavior can be that, in my case, is I'm just regarding the fallout on the bystander. But in many kinds of moral systems, Rawlsianism is an example, Kantianism is a good example, where who you are is unimportant. In these moral systems, two moral individuals will have exactly the same target because we are trying to maximize the same thing. If both of us are utilitarian, if all the players are utilitarians, then the payoff matrix, every box will have only one number, the payoff, the collective payoff. So if our ethic was of the kind that all of us shared the same morality, same consequentialist moral morality, then this game would become what in the language of game theory is called a unanimity game. In this game, there are not two numbers or n numbers in each box, there's one number. Since all of us are trying to maximize that total payoff. With that, with a unanimity game, you can't get the kind of paradox that I'm talking about. That can be shown, but you can get a paradox via vo a focal point, use of focal point in an un interesting, unusual way. Not quite as, I think, morally troublesome as the example given, but that's possible. So, but the, thinking about this, James, which took me into um, a, a thought of my own, that we do think in terms of the individual being totally unimportant when you're doing a moral judgment, Kantian principle or Rawlsian principle from behind the veil of ignorance, you don't know who you are, you choose. But in reality, uh, and, and the way I would advise someone, I wouldn't tell that person that give zero weight to yourself, to your children, to your family. That's a natural part of human biological makeup. I would say, yes, it's natural that you will be concerned about yourself, family, immediate friends, you are concerned. That is a group that you have an instinctive, this is our biological feature, that close friends, close family, we are concerned. But think beyond that as well. Not about other people who are well off, but people. That's also a morality which is not utilitarian, and it is not, nor is it from behind the veil of ignorance because it matters who you are, you are taking account of that. I would love to actually do some thinking where it is morality, properly moral, but the individual is also there. That's a biological fact that I cannot deny. My considering my friends to be special, I would like to do things for this is hardwired inside me. But beyond that, there is something else being urged. This is again, you know, I don't know enough of moral philosophy. So for all of these things, I, I suspect there must be some literature, but I'm sorry, I don't even know how to switch this off. So uh, with that, uh, that, yeah, that's a sort of uh, reminder for me maybe to stop. Should I stop? Because do you want to take in questions from the floor? How do you want to do this? Yes, indeed. Or do you yes, want indeed. To... We, have yeah. we have questions. Uh, let's proceed. Uh, let's proceed. I'll start with the first I'll one. I'll start with the first uh, one. Let's, uh... Uh, mute yourself first, though. Uh, first, from uh, Himadri Chakrabarti, can we attribute this to moral responsibility as to why people elect political parties and not individuals or politicians during elections. Also, is moral responsibility segregated into collective, individual, and leader as well? And then I'll continue. Um, we have a question from uh, Hernando Grueso saying, game theory assumes that individuals are fully rational. However, what could be the implication of present bias or the morality paradox? For example, two players try to behave more, more, morally, but they miscalculate which strategy maximizes the poor's utility. Let's start with those two. Thank you. Yeah, the first one from Himadri. I, I take away, uh, I'm changing your question a little bit in answering. I mean, uh, why do people elect parties, not individuals? That, of course, depends on the system already that the country has chosen. You very often get committed to one or the other. Uh, but what I take your question is raising is another important matter that uh, 
very often before the game starts, there are choices that we have made which makes us responsible. Like, if I choose to belong to a particular group and then that group behaves badly, you can say that I have a kind of responsibility because I've chosen a group that has behaved badly. So our prior choices make a difference. The way I would handle that is I would just build a larger game tree, a bigger game where the game is not just choosing actions A and B, but your initial choices. I will belong to this group. I will do this thing. I will choose individuals. All that has to be a part of the game and you will have to analyze that. My hunch is even with that, you will get a similar paradox. And now I'm coming to the next question. I didn't catch the name of the person asking the question, but I got the question fully. The present bias, which we know is important. There's enough behavioral economics that points to that. If you have present bias, and even the moral creatures have present bias, would you get this kind of a paradox? I'm close to certain, the answer is yes. Uh, and this has nothing to do with the initial assumption that individuals are completely selfish. It has actually, that part of it in my, my example is a mechanical assumption. I just took it out of standard game theory. I could have made individuals more complex, bring in psychological um, um, weaknesses that are common to us, built that in, and still got a paradox where as soon as you bring in, in addition to present bias, a morality, a dose of morality, morality in the way that James put it, other regarding uh, choice, other regarding choice with uh, present bias, you will get the paradox. I'm close to certain, I mean, these are things, of course, still I do it. One is never 100% sure, but I don't think that's where the catch is. In fact, the reason I've, I've spent so much time thinking about this, I don't think there's a catch of that kind. It is a question that individuals being moral can lead to an outcome which is immoral. You can put in little doses of reality, you'll still keep getting that back. And that poses the, James used a term, uh, um, uh, which uh, is, uh, uh, I've lost it now, that, um, uh, um, oh yeah, we have to, what I'm raising is we have to grope for solutions. So the problem is what I'm giving you, and you have to grope for solutions which is thinking outside of the game, the game changers. How do you modify the game and what kinds of ethic you build up is my expectation. Yeah, next. So we have a question from Parviz Dabir Alai. Uh, he asks, um, relationship between morality and trust. In the realms of political discourse, I would think the link is important. Does your research address this point? Jeffrey Quo asks, thanks, Dr. Basu, for the great presentation and the elaboration of the game you constructed. I'm wondering if the game is a repeated or sequential, if the game is repeated or sequential game instead of the one-shot game, do you expect the same paradox to show up again? And then we have a question from Renuka Bhatt, who asks, in the scenario where one person is moral, assuming morality implies self-harming preferences, wouldn't the outcome be similar to the chicken game? Parvez, uh, who is an old friend of mine, haven't seen him for a very long time. So Parvez, um, there is a morality and trust. Uh, uh, the reason I'm stumbling in giving this answer is actually I've, uh, both those topics are of great interest to me. Uh, just that I've never thought of that collectively. See, one. First of all, let me just underline, just like I think morality is important. I feel morality is important uh, because it is actually good for the economy, but that's a wrong way to put it. Even if it was not good, good for the economy, it's an end in itself. A moral compass is an end in itself that we should have, is my view on morality. But a lot of the time it is actually good for the economy, not always. Even if not, I, I think if it is moral and you've reached that conclusion, you should stick to that. Trust is actually uniformly good for the economy. From Francis Fukuyama's sweeping descriptions of societies that have developed trust have done better. Scandinavian Nordic countries have a huge amount of trust in one another, they do better. But this is not genetically hardwired. You don't have to be a Scandinavian to have that. Trust and uh, um, uh, in society have emerged in East Asia in a big way. 
later, but it is there. I mean, Korean society is a very trusting society. Japanese society is a very trusting society, and that plays a big role. And I, I know I'm digressing from this topic. The reason why I think that is actually important for economists to understand is that life is full of contracts where you can't have the contract enforced by the law. Uh, the big contracts, we do have them enforced by the law. When I'm taking a loan from a bank saying that I'll pay that back over the next 30 years, the bank manager is not going to say that, okay, good, you're promising to pay back, so here is the money, go away and pay it for the next 30 years. I trust you, that won't happen. We'll write it down, the law comes in. But think of the number of things in life we do where it's little bits of trust. I do something and I trust you. I take a taxi ride where the taxi driver gives you the ride without signing a contract. When you get into a taxi, you don't sign a contract saying that I'll first give you a ride and then you will pay me. There's no contract. You reach the end, you can run away, but you don't run away. You typically don't run away after taking the taxi ride. Trust is critical, absolutely, because the law and enforcement can't do it. So I feel it's important. Now, your question is making me think actually, the way I was posing the morality question is not bringing in trust at all. You've just become moral. You uh, want to moral in the sense that you are now, uh, you've got empathy, you've got kindness. So to the poor person, you, you want to empathize and do something. Would trust make a difference? It could make a difference. If you treated trust as, a, as an additional moral quality, then when everyone becomes trustworthy, everyone becomes moral, if it is also the case that everyone becomes trustworthy, it may cease to be a game in a conventional sense. In a game, the whole thing is, we are not trustworthy. I'm doing what I'm trying to maximize, you're trying to maximize what you're doing, and that's why the strategic, the word that we use, that the game theory is a strategic environment. I'm trying to get my way, you're trying to get your way. If we become totally trusting, it, in fact, it may become a very boring world because it will cease to be a game anymore. It's no longer a game because we are completely trusting creatures. So maybe morality with trust blended with it could take us out of that, but that still does not take away from the fact that what I was saying and what James is later saying, that we have to think of the game from outside of the box, the game changes thing, that we may want to say that just trust, just morality is not good enough. Morality has to be combined with trust, so the game has to be conceived differently. Jeffrey, I'm moving to the next question from Jeffrey. This, I don't know, uh, that if this becomes a repeated game, this is what I will tell you. I feel the paradox will go through for the following reason, that after you've constructed a repeated game, you can collapse that repeated game, the extensive form game, into its strategic form or normal form. So you probably, since you seem to be familiar with repeated games, repeated games, extensive form games, can also be collapsed and written down just like a normal form game. In the end, normal form, strategic form game, it can be converted to. And which makes me feel that the two examples that I have could be constructed from some repeated game where once you collapse the repeated game into its strategic form or normal form, you get the game that I have described, which makes me feel that the paradox will arise with repetition, with, uh, and you know, about the paradox, I'm not saying that every game is riddled with this paradox, that you can construct situations, realistic situations, realistic games where the paradox arises. So the short answer again is my intuition. Yes, it will go through. Renuka, Renuka Bhatt, I think is the name. Um, one plus self, uh, oh, self-hating preference. Yeah, that's an interesting thing over here. Um, um, if the person becomes a self-hater, oh, I'm almost certain I, I can write down a very interesting result. Uh, first of all, it's about a group of people, a group of individuals who are, who are playing a game where all of them are self-haters. They are trying to hurt themselves. I feel it will be a very easy prisoner's dilemma construction that they will be very disappointed in the end that they have actually not hurt themselves. Uh, a group of self-haters self playing the prisoner's dilemma will actually do well for themselves because they are trying to hurt themselves and you'll get an inverted prisoner's dilemma where you will come out doing well. But of course, being self-haters, 
you will feel bad about uh, the fact that you have not managed to hurt yourself. Here comes a bit of a difficult question for, uh, this is for psychologists now. If self-hating is just a reversal of the payoffs, what is a positive payoff now is a negative payoff, then you'll get all these paradoxes coming exactly in the same way because self-hater is being allowed in game theory. I don't know what your payoff that number represents. That payoff a number can represent how much dollar you've lost because you're a self-hater. So it can be exactly the same game. But again, if there are psychologists in the audience, they may argue that self-hatred is not just inversion of preference. It's something more than that. If that ha happens again, yes, there are complications indeed. So very incomplete answer, but I'll leave you with that. What would happen if one player becomes sadistic instead of altruistic? So we're going on different uh, preference assumptions here. Second, Andrew asks, in the initial assumptions of the game, you, the uh, assumption what you mentioned was that um, a person would treat a dollar of a poorer person's money as one dollar of their own money. However, a dollar for a poor person may be a much larger percentage of his or her overall assets. What, what are the implications of that? And from uh, Stuti Vora, we have established that a partway shift from self-serving society to an altruistic one often leads to moral behavior. But since a complete shift is not possible, what's a society supposed to aim at? And Arun Keshoff asks, uh, I assume knowing that you have a lot of work on corruption, asks any analysis on corruption using game theory, question mark? If one player, player uh, becomes uh, sadistic, uh, nice question. And these things actually you can, from uh, what you have in the game, you, you'll already um, be able to construct. You'll, I'm sure it'll, it'll need pen and paper and sitting down for a while that in a game theoretic environment, sadism may actually make you confer benefit on the others. Do you get it? It'll, it'll get reversed that you're, you become a, you're a sadistic person you want to hurt the other person, there will be games where that objective will actually make you benefit the other person. This is virtually an inversion of my game, and I'm pretty sure that this you can do. These are all things that you'll have to sit down a little bit with, uh, play with pen and paper and write down the payoff function in a way that your aim now after you, and just like you went to the seminary and came back, send this person to a school from where this player one comes back, now a sadist. This person's aim is to actually inflict harm on the person. With this game, you won't get it. But with a different set of numbers, you'll get this magical result that after becoming a person who wants to inflict harm on others, in a strategic environment, you're actually conferring benefits on others. It's, it's entirely possible. This will be a, just a change in the numbers. It'll be fun to play around with this. The, uh, perver perverted impact of individual sadism is going to be your paper out of this. Yeah, try it out. Andrew, um, I hope I, I, I understood your question right. And this moral person is treating a poor person's dollar uh, like my own dollar. And what you're probably pointing to is that when it's a very poor person and I'm a millionaire, uh, I should realize that that person's one dollar is uh, actually should be treated as more than one dollar, five dollars, ten dollars. First of all, the paradox you will very easily get because then what I can say is that through the action that I'm taking, that player, the bystander, gets twenty cents. If I value twenty cents as five times that, then the game will be written up the way I have written up. The, uh, my, through my action, the other player is getting a dollar when actually that person is getting 20 cents. So do you see that? So the, again, the construction, if instead of giving, uh, treating my dollar as uh, a one dollar $1 for the other person, if I say that whatever the, that poor person is getting, you must blow up five times, you can construct the same paradox. You start by saying that the fallout of our action is not $2, $8, etc., but 40 cents, 80 cents, et cetera. And then because I value 40 cents as $2 or whatever it is, write down the payoffs, which will begin to look like exactly the payoff that I've got. 
in terms of my valuation of that. So that is, yeah, as morally, I will teach people that, but the paradox will remain very, very similar um, 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 out of this. The last question, actually, um, oh, game theory and corruption. I couldn't catch the name of the person who was asking. Uh, James, uh, I can give a, a three, four minute spiel on, I have actually used game theory and corruption, uh, done quite a bit. Some people will already know about this. Should I do that or are there more questions? Otherwise, I will cite some reference and uh, not answer this. Ton of questions. Ton of questions. Uh, so therefore, so yes, give us yes. Let, and Arun, uh, then, uh, Arun, Arun with his name. Okay, Arun, let, let me just tell you, uh, I won't get you, get into the details of this because there may be a chance to take on one more question, but here's the thing. I do believe, actually, this is one area where game theory is important, uh, uh, analyzing corruption. And uh, I've uh, done work, you'll find uh, a paper of mine which had caused a lot of controversy, still sitting on the Ministry of Finance website in uh, India, where I used to be an advisor, where the posting of the paper almost led me to having to exit from government because it was very controversial. Very simple use of a two-period game and sub-game perfection, all in completely in words, arguing that India's Prevention of Corruption Act 1988 ought to be changed. I still believe that that is true, but there are other areas. You know, uh, the use of game theory and um, the corruption is important because very often in countries you get leaders who come to power genuinely anti-corruption. They want to put an end to corruption. What happens after they come to power is they realize that in some countries, corruption is so rampant that you've got a choice about who you first round up. And any politician's first thought is, I'm not going to round up my friends first. If you round up the people in your own political party, you'll be thrown out of power immediately. You have no one supporting you. So if you have a choice, embarrassment of riches, which corrupt person do you catch? Your first instinct is to catch corrupt people on the other side, corrupt people in the media who are criticizing you. And invariably, these anti-corruption moves become a persecution moves of opposition, of stamping down on any criticism, and an author first step towards authoritarianism. So starting from really a desirable move to control corruption, it ends up with political leaders becoming authoritarian and using it as an instrument we've repeatedly seen across the world and we need to design systems and come up to the leader saying, while you're still good, you're newly come into power before you get corrupted, put this system in place. So a lot of thinking to be done there. I've done a little bit of thinking, but let me leave it at that. So, so a couple of questions. A couple from of questions from Mr. Sarma. First is, um, you know, does the result, does your way of thinking about it, depend on the ratio of the players to the bystanders? And if there's altruism, over time, do you think that there would become more and more players? And uh, then Sunil Sharma asks, can society develop norms that use deontological or teleological ethical justifications or some combinations depending on the context and situation. Now, uh, that same sentence once again. I will. I will. Can social, can social society develop norms that use deontological or teleological ethical justification or some combination, depending on the context and situation? I mean, yeah, can you make rules for every possible situation or does it have to just be con context focused there was one um, sorry there was one about the bystanders uh, the first question and this is from sunil the second one the bystanders you're saying that i i if i caught it right that if the proportion of players to proportion of bystanders changes uh, what would happen it's thinking outside the box for me uh, you'll have to, first of all, uh, well, well, you can do it with three uh, people, one player, two players, three players, uh, two bystanders, one bystander, zero bystander, that's the way it'll go. But to pose it in an interesting way, if you're 
you'll have to start ideally with n individuals in society and change the proportion of players and bystanders. So it's possible. It's a big agenda uh, um, uh, doing that. Do you want to do it as an extensive form game while the change is taking place or otherwise? But it's so big that in the last minute of the conversation, I won't even try to speculate on that. I'm jumping to Sunil's question. Sunil, great to uh, see you. Um, deontological and teleological as well, because uh, the way I'm posing, the, the only kind of deontological ethic that appeals to me is that uh, uh, the, where the ethic derives from ultimate group consequentialism. I have a paper called the Waterfall Paradox, which is on Escher's waterfall. This is in, in Games and Economic Behavior, which uses uh, uh, in, uh, the famous Escher's waterfall picture as an illustration uh, of a game where every action seems to take you in one direction, but in the end, you end up at the bottom of the waterfall. This is the MC Escher's stair staircase is similar, and the waterfall is similar in art. And my game is a construction that that is possible in a very large society. Infinite number of individuals, you can get that. So I derive all the deontological ethics that I try to follow in life, try, I mean, who can succeed from these consequentialist objectives or teleological objectives. This is the large long run thing that I'm trying to achieve. But for that, we have to all go by rules. If each one of us does each step, even morally, but by consequentialism, you may fall into MC Escher's waterfall trap. You think you're moving up, but collectively you end up moving at, uh, to the bottom of that. So there is the deontological ethics you bring in in that sense, and that can solve the problem. If you were asking the question, will it solve the problem? Always, I don't know, and I don't think so. I'm generally a skeptic. My hunch is, who knows whether all these moral problems that we get into, whether we'll be able to solve them. And I also, as a consequence, I do worry that human beings collectively, we could fall into the dinosaur trap. The dinosaur behaved in a particular way, which became not existentially uh, um, uh, um, uh, robust anymore. At some point, the uh, dinosaurs vanished. Human society has more hope because unlike the dinosaur, the game that we are playing among ourselves, we also have the capacity to step back and say that, look, the game that we are playing is destructive for us collectively. We have to change the game that we are playing in certain ways. So we can raise these questions and begin to change. But is it always the case that we will be able to do that? I frankly don't know. I like to believe we will do that and we will escape the dinosaur's predicament, but I'm not sure. I just hope and pray that we will be able to escape that, but I don't know. And I, 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 it broke up James's reading of that question at that point, and you were using uh, these uh, terms which are very loaded terms. So I don't know whether I answered your question, but I, I'm going to leave it at that. Fair enough. Fair and, enough. And in, uh, we want to thank uh, Koshik uh, Basu for spending uh, an hour and a half with us. Really appreciate it. Um, I must say, uh, it's been uh, it's been a wonderful time uh, to hear what you're up to. Um, we'll try and get all the questions down and deliver them to you, so you can at least have a look at them and give uh, appropriate uh, credit to the extent that uh, it informs what you're thinking. But let's call it quits now and say thank you for all of you who are still in the audience for staying with us. Sorry for all of you who I didn't get to your questions. Hope you had a good time. And we'll see you next time here in Washington, D.C. at the Institute for International Economic Policy. Thank you.